I would like to start by recall, recalling a letter which I had recently received from uh, the Ukraine and another letter which I got from a monastery in Russia. Both speak in the same direction. The one in uh, Russia is signed by the Brotherhood and it says we have heard that in the West there are three heretics. Two of them we have been able to trace. Their names are Father Alexander Schmemann and Father John Mandorf. The third one we cannot find out who he is. Could you explain to us? His name is Anthony Bloom. Well, this is an introduction to what I'm going to say, because I'm going to speak of men and women from a point of view which perhaps is not habitual. And I will also apologize before I start for the fact that I will probably speak in a rather shaky way because I don't feel well. <laughs> the theme of the men and women in the Old and New Testament begins at the very beginning of Genesis. And we all know what it says. It says to us that God created the Garden of Eden, planted there two trees, the one the knowledge of God and the other one the knowledge of good and evil. And here is the first problem that arises between us, before us. Does the fact that God planted these two trees make him responsible for the fall. Because there is a tree that inevitably, according to habitual parlance, leads to the fall of Adam and Eve and with them of all the human race and consequently all the tragedy of the world. There is a passage in the works of St. Irenaeus of Lyon which I think is worth remembering although it has not become part of the habitual comments. It says that God planted these two trees and he offered to humans two ways of achieving their vocation. Not one which was a catastrophic fall from grace and the destruction of all that God had intended, but one which was one possibility different from the other. The tree of the knowledge of God is a simple problem. Obviously it's not a question of trees, of apples and of fruit to be eaten, but of different ways of approaching things. The one speaks of the possibility which we have of forgetting all things except God, striving to know Him from all, with all our being, with all the means that are at our disposal, and in knowing God to discover the meaning of all things. This is a way of saintliness, of holiness. The saints of God discovered him and in the light of God began to understand the world which God had created. But the other one is not a tree of temptation in the sense in which we understand it. It's a tree in which, which says to us, you can discover the world. You can 
discover the created in your own created way. And that will separate you from God because it's not a direct relatedness to him, but may re lead you to the knowledge of what God has created and of God himself. Because when we consider the works of an artist, we do not discover only the substance, the subject of it, we discover also the artist himself. To be very quick and speak of the obvious, when we are presented with the painters, paintings of the great painters or with icons, we would look at an icon and say, this is Theophan, the Greek. This one is Rublov. When we look at paintings, we would say, this is Rubens and this is Rembrandt. Because both are marked, sealed, as it were, by the personality of him who painted it. And so, by discovering the world, the created world, as it is, not by first communing with God to such a perfection that we see it with God's own eyes, but with our created eyes, we may also discover God. This is a very important thing, because on the one hand, it is evidence, which I believe God doesn't need, that he has not create, planted a tree that will lead us into temptation and the destruction of the world. On the other hand, that the knowledge of the world which God has created can lead us to the knowledge of God. Science can, beauty can, love can, even on the level of human relationships. This is a primal situation. We are confronted with two possible ways of achieving our vocation, of becoming gradually, either directly through heroic endeavor of saintliness, people who know God in communion, or who, in this complex way, of discovering the works of God to discover the maker. That is an important thing when we think of the relationship between Adam and Eve, because we usually are told that Eve got tempted, took of the tree <coughs> of death, and shared death with her husband. What we, never, we do not mention habitually is something which I believe is of great importance because it is not Eve alone who took responsibility for the consequences of her having chosen the way of knowledge. When later Adam and Eve can hear God moving in the Garden of Eden, they hide. They hide because they have discovered through the break of the uniqueness of the relationship with God, they have discovered their own nakedness, their own unworthiness. And God says, where are you? And Adam says something which is a decisive moment in the destiny of mankind. He says, it is the, the wife whom you have given me, who gave me to taste of this fruit. In other words, instead of saying, alas, we have been beguiled. Alas, we have made a mistake. Alas, we want to repent. We want to come back. We want forgiveness. We want healing. His answer is, you are responsible for it. And this is the crowning, if one may speak in such terms, the crowning moment 
or the fall. Then comes another moment. I have got to move fast through a very complex story. God speaks to them and he says, from now on, men will have power over women and women have longing for men. This is a tragic moment when a relationship is completely falsified because instead of being a harmony, a oneness, it becomes a hierarchy. To this I will come now. In another passage from the, the, uh, the book of Genesis, we are told that God created men. The word used is not men in the English sense, but men in a more general sense, what one could, would say in Greek, anthropos, in uh, Russian, Chelevek, the total human being. And at that moment, it is one total human being in the image of God. It is an icon, which is humanity reflecting the beauty and the nature of God. And then we see later in the following chapters that men, I will put it in my own way because there is little time to develop point by point, men matures. He becomes more and more what he is called to be. He was called to be in the image of God. To begin with, he was created in the image, but not evolved into his final vocation. And the moment comes when the one Anthropos, the one Shalevek, can no longer contain both the humanity of men and the humanity of women. And at that moment, God confronts him with a new decision. He brings to him all the creatures, of life, living creatures, and man discovers that all creatures are pairs, male and female. He is the only one who is alone. And at that moment, because he longs to achieve that fullness, God divides in him what is male and what is female. This is a decisive and very important moment. But it's not a moment where the two things are opposed to one another or opposable. It's a moment when they are totally, perfectly complementary. In the story, when men, the human, the anthropos is divided into male and female, we are told that Adam looks at Eve and says something which in the English translation, in the Russian translation is practically incomprehensible, but which in the Hebrew text makes sense. He looks at her and says, I am Ish, she is Isha, the same being in the masculine and the feminine. It is not to oppose the different creatures, it is the femininity on the one hand, the masculinity on the other hand, that are one person. And to use the phrase of Professor Troitsky, at that moment they are one personality in two persons. They are one. And they are now fulfilling this oneness in two different persons. At that moment, they are not separate. They are one. 
There is a remarkable passage in um, a rabbi's writing in which he says, why is it that the Bible speaks of Eve being made out of a rib of Adam? And he says, because the rib is the nearest part to the heart. She is born of the heart, as it were. One could also comment by saying that it's not a question of physical ribs, and one could understand it in the way in which in French one would understand the difference between court and côté, that is, side and rib, and that the division between Adam, the original anthropos is an act of God that divide, separates the two halves of the oneness which is man. But then what happens next? They are in a fallen world. They are in a world which, uh, they are in a world in, um, into which sin is coming. And at that moment, the moment Adam and Eve taste of the tree of death, something decisive occurs. They see one another as being the other one. Not the other myself, but an other one. Not me, made visible in incredible beauty in the person of the other, but an other one different from me. At that moment, Adam and Eve discover that they are separated by sin and that they are no longer one person, one personality in two persons. They are still a personality, but in two persons broken away from one another. And this is presented to us by the words of the Bible that says, they looked at one another and they saw that they were naked. When Adam and Eve were formed by an act of God as two persons being one personality, they did not see one another naked because one doesn't see oneself naked. One can see only the other one or an other one in his or her nakedness. At that moment, they see one another naked, which means they recognize they are different. They are no longer one. They are one tangentially, but not one in the original way in which nothing separated them from one another. And then the history of mankind begins. Then the whole world begins to break up. I'm not going to uh, speak of the history of Genesis, but do realize that this was a turning point, a tragic turning point. But what happens next? Next, death comes. Death comes, as we can see from, I think, the sixth chapter of Genesis, gradually. You can see through the list of people how gradually the lives of people become shorter and shorter and shorter, except for two men who live longer than anyone else because they were so united with God. But death is there. And as they are no longer one, as they have brought death into the world, the whole world is shaken to the ground. And the flood comes, and after the flood, a new mark of tragedy. After the flood, the Lord says, to Adam and Eve, all animals are delivered for you to you for food. They will be your food and you will be their terror. This is a last break in relationship of harmony in the created world. And then we know the story of how life develops. <clears throat> 
But when, if we turn now to the New Testament, what do we see? We see men and women in the mutual dependence which was described by God. Men lording it over women, women longing for men. That is a tragedy. It is not a normal relationship of two who are mirroring one another, seeing one another as their own revelation of beauty, of wholeness, of perfection. But Christ comes. The world is redeemed. Something decisive happens. Yes. Redemption is there. Christ is a revelation to us of the totality of the human being. He is the man, the anthropos by excellence. In him we see the fullness of men. But we see also what man was called to be. United with God in an inseparable and total manner. Looking at him, we can see what we have lost and what we were called to. But how is it then that in the church where the victory of Christ has taken place, things remain so uneven? Because it is only when all things will be fulfilled that the curse or the fall will be gone from us. The relationship between men and women in the New Testament becomes different from what it was in the beginning of Genesis. But it is not yet perfect because it is only after the final victory that it will become such. I'm sorry, one minute. We find in St. Paul a passage in which we are told that since the Incarnation, since the work of salvation of Christ, his victory over death and sin, his resurrection, his, his ascension into heaven, things are different. There is no longer Greek or Gentile. There is no longer man or woman. We are all one creature in Christ. But this is something for which we must struggle. It is something which is given and which must be taken. It is there for us to take and yet at the same time it must be conquered over unworthiness, over sin, over all that divides us within ourselves and separates us from one another. Men against men, woman against woman, men against woman and woman against men. By the imperfect reception of the gift of God. We live in a twilight, in the twilight of history, between the radiant light of the creation before the fall and the glorious light of the final victory of God when God shall have won and all be all in God. But in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile we are potentially what St. Paul says, there is no man or woman. There is one beloved creature of God. We can learn to grow 
into that mutual recognition and discovery which is signified by the words of St. Paul. But there is a passage to which I think I want to attract your attention briefly. The passage about marriage. The union of men and women. I'm sorry. Men presented as an icon of Christ makes very often men proud, arrogant, and more stupid than is necessary. Because very often men, when they think of marriage or of all relationships, think in terms of being an icon of Christ. The accent being put on Christ and not an icon. An icon means an image, but not the thing itself. We are surrounded with icons. And yet, not one of these icons is the person represented on it. It is a window open for us to pass through it. And this is made so clear, so impressively clear to me, by a passage in St. John Chrysostom, when he says, if you want to pray, put yourself in, in front of an icon of Christ, then shut your eyes and pray to Christ. Look at the icon, because it makes you aware of Christ to the extent to which we can know him, not as the unknowable Son of God, but as the Son of God becomes the Son of Men. But then shut your eyes and forget the image which you see to commune with the one who is beyond the image. And so it is also in the way in which we should relate to one another. We should learn to look at each other, look deeply, look with the same veneration, with the same admiration with which we look at an icon, and then look beyond what we see to what we do not see, to the image of God, but not the image visible, but the invisible image of God imprinted in us. One of the fathers of the desert says, who has seen his brother has seen his God. Yes, provided his attention is not arrested, frozen upon what he sees. Look and see this is for you, an icon. But beyond the lines and the colors, there is the invisible presence. This is how we should learn to look at one another. And this is the relationship which St. Paul describes between men and women. The husband is an image. But he is not the reality itself. He must grow into becoming more and more a reality. But he is not it at the outset, at the beginning. And so the relationship is a complex one, which I have described once, perhaps untheologically and impertinently, by saying to a young woman who was to marry a rather doubtful character and uh, saying to me, but he is Christ in our marriage. I said, he is an icon of Christ all right, but he is a very badly painted icon. And you must learn 
to see beyond this poor painting the reality and help this person to become what he is allegedly according to scripture truly but allegedly according to every day's experience well these are the main things which I wanted to tell you about the relationship between men and women and Christ the creation of men and women in one person the gradual unfolding of possibilities in this Chalavik until it can no longer be contained within one human person the bursting of this limited situation into two persons but into two persons which are totally complementary in which each can see the other as the other man's self the alter ego but not an alter not the other one but me revealed to me with the beauty which I could not see in myself and then the rest of what I said about the complex struggle which must occur between within us and between us in order to overcome the separatedness that we call nakedness which we call desire which we call possessiveness which we call overpowering we can call ruling over one another and which on the other hand means submissiveness enslavement fear all of them contrary to what God has willed now in this context I would like to say just a few words about something which is on the fringe of my subject one speaks very much in the West about the ordination of women to the priesthood a thing that strikes me is that this is not something that is being spoken of naturally in uh, the Orthodox world among women why I think it comes partly from the fact that the priesthood the royal priesthood of which St. Paul speaks is not a male function it consists in bringing oneself as a total offering to God and bringing all things around us to God for them to be sanctified and become holy not with the primeval holiness that was destroyed by the fall but by a holiness which derives from the incarnation of Christ on the other hand in the West the priesthood has acquired a dimension which it did not possess in the Orthodox Church at least so I believe in the West a priest is endowed with a supernatural power the power to consecrate bread and wine to make them into the body and blood of Christ we have an example from the Middle Ages that brings that out almost in a monstrous way but very clearly a priest who had been dismissed because he was a drunkard comes into a pub he sees a barrel of wine and he pronounces over this wine the words of consecration and what was the result? 
the bishop of the place with his clergy comes and takes all this battle of wine because it has become the body of Christ. In spite of the fact that this man was a drunken priest and a priest who had been dismissed from his function. Once a priest, a priest forever, with a power which is Christ's own. In orthodoxy, we have never had this attitude. And therefore, people who wish to have the incredible power expressed in this ugly story, but also in so many other ways in the church, doesn't exist for us. A priest for us is one who is singled out by his people to be sent into the sanctuary, which is a pla place of holiness into which one cannot enter without terror, without a sense that I'm entering into a world into which I have no place and into which I'm being sent because, and received by God. And the priest is one who is not endowed with power. When in the liturgy, the consecration of the Holy Gifts takes place, we pray the Holy Spirit to come down upon the Holy Gifts to make this bread into the body of Christ, this wine into the blood of Christ. And the priest, the priest is only one who prays Christ to come and fill and fulfill, achieve what is humanly impossible. No degree of consecration to the episcopate, no degree of ordination to the priesthood can give a human being power over bread to cease to be bread and become the body of Christ or power over God to force him into these creatures of bread and wine. Only Christ can do it and not by forcing himself but because in his incarnation he has become one with the created world. And when he blessed, the Holy Spirit descends upon this bread and wine, they are integrated to his incarnate body. They become what he is through the incarnation. Who would dare wish to be a priest in terms of power if you think in those terms? It's a place of terror. I remember an example. I will give you an example which I will never forget in my life. A few months after my ordination, I was about to celebrate the liturgy and suddenly terror came upon me that I cannot do it. I cannot possibly stand before the holy table. I cannot possibly pronounce words of consecration. And I was just about to take off my vestments when suddenly I felt that I was pushed away from the table to the holy doors and I became aware that someone was standing there and I celebrated. I said all the words of the liturgy and I knew with all my being that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was the celebrant. He was standing before the holy table. He was the one who is being the celebrant. I have never forgotten that. And every priest should be able to become aware of this. It is Christ alone who is the high priest of creation, who is a celebrant of every sacrament and mystery. It is the Holy Spirit who descends upon the holy gifts at his prayer in the unity of their common life. Who would wish to be a priest in terms of power, of dignity,
of becoming something which others are not. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why men must hesitate, must approach the priesthood in fear, in terror, in horror, in the awareness that they have no right to stand where they stand. They are sent by the whole church to stand there. The church is a warrant of their presence, but the consecrator is Christ. The power is the Holy Spirit. There is nothing to be proud of. There is only a reason to be afraid, to be in awe. There is nothing else. But if that is the case, who can wish to become a priest simply for the glory of it, in order to occupy a, a situation which no one else does occupy? I do not know how things will develop in the Orthodox Church, because there is in the Church no difference between men and women. There is more to be uh, discovered about what is peculiar to men and what is peculiar to women. St. Paul is clear when he says that there is no difference between men and women. But there is something which I would add, and this will be the end of my long discourse. There is one thing which I want to add, that man has got to discover what woman possesses in order to correct what is a temptation of power and of pride in men. If you remember the crucifixion, Calvary, you will remember what was there. There was a cross upon which the Son of God, who had become the Son of Man, because a woman had believed totally, wholeheartedly, given herself to God to be the instrument of salvation for mankind. And this man was dying in an act of self-sacrificial love. And the woman was there. The one, Mary, whose faith in God had been such that God could become man through her, in her. It is her humanity she had given him. And she was standing there, fulfilling the prophecy. She was bringing him as an offering to God to die for the salvation of the world. It was an act of perfect love of God, an incredible love of mankind. Because looking around, it was not love she saw. It was mockery. It was hatred. It was murderous feelings and thoughts. And she was offering her son for those people and for all those who had lived before alien to God and those who would live after alien, inimical, hating God. And then there was one more person. There was a young disciple who was young, who was not yet John the theologian. He was John, who so loved Christ that his whole being was an act of love. Because he could love in such a way, he could be there, present at the death of one who was love incarnate. And yet, the women were there. At a short distance, the women who had followed Christ from the beginning was there, present with him. They had one thing in common with Mary, with John. It was love. Love, not theology. Not intellectual exercise. Love to the point of being ready to be singled out, beaten up, murdered, rejected as disciples of him who was dying on the cross. And where were the disciples? One, Judas, 
had hanged himself because he had betrayed his master. The other, Peter, had run away, renouncing Christ at a moment when he was challenged by a young girl saying, you also were with him. And the other ones, as the gospel tells us, were hiding in the house of John Mark for fear. And it is only the coming to them of Christ's reason that brought them back to their faith and to their faithfulness. Men have got to learn from women all that is contained in these images which I give, which I cannot um, d describe because I know nothing about it. I'm a man in the worst sense of the word. But we men must learn from women. And only then can one think that perhaps women may learn something from men and perhaps the royal priesthood will unfold both men and women in one victory which is the ultimate victory of Christ coming back to us. I apologize for the shaky way in which I have given this talk, but I don't feel well these days. <laughs>